Welcome to Talking Beats. I hope you'll subscribe and give us a five-star review on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash talking beats. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash talking beats. We believe now more than ever in providing a platform for individuality, free thought, and a diverse range of views. By supporting the show this way, you'll get early access to episodes, bonus episodes, and much more. And remember, the conversation is always active at Talking Beats Podcast on social media. On today's program, neuroscientist Wendy Suzuki. She studies the brain's ability to change in response to the environment, often referred to as brain plasticity. She's professor of neural science at New York University, where she runs the Wendy Suzuki Lab and inspires students and works with them on a regular basis. She is the author of a number of highly regarded books, including the much-beloved Healthy Brain, Happy Life, a personal program to activate your brain and do everything everything better. I'm so pleased to have her right here with me, Wendy Suzuki. Welcome. Thank you, Daniel. So what a pleasure to be here. I love your positivity. Where does it come from? Uh, I think it comes from, um, I think it comes from my dad. My dad was always just a happy person. He was a happy person. Okay. So your dad was happy. It, it was infectious. It got into you. Uh, it, it, happiness and, and, and joy are infectious things we talk about all the time in music. We know when I play a Beethoven symphony, I look out at the end and there are tears streaming down and people yeah. are, are cheering and smiling. There's something infectious about the joy. We've been talking a lot about Beethoven 9 recently, which is a great ode to brotherhood, to humanity. Uh, yeah. how, does that, how does that play into your work? Well... I'll tell you, I agreed to this podcast because you are a musician, uh, uh, an amazing musician, and I have such high esteem of professional musicians and cellists in particular. I am a wannabe cello cellist. I have a cello behind me that that needs me to take lessons to play it. <laughs> really? Wow. <laughs> yes. And... Um, I think music, I, I took piano lessons from, a, from, you know, being a small child and um, music has always affected my emotions greatly. All kinds of music, classical music, musicals. I'm a huge fan of the Broadway musical. I live in New York City and um, I think there are, there have been geniuses that have written some of the classic musicals of our time um, and current geniuses that are working today. So music effects um, has, is just so important and so effective in engaging our emotional, our emotions. Absolutely. So, so you had music sort of in your ear from, from a kid. Did, did you play growing up? You played piano growing up or you yes. played? I yeah. played piano, classical piano growing up all through, um, I think I started when I was seven or eight and all through high school. You know, I, I don't want to talk about music the whole time, although that, that's that's easy to do. That would, that would be nice. But but since we're since we're on the topic, let's just not leave immediately. So could you talk a little bit about what the brain gets yeah. from music? You talk a lot about exercise, which is fascinating. And I want to go there, too. But yeah. but what does music do for the brain and, and, and frame it in the way that, that you loved it as a kid? You were studying piano, doing your scales and arpeggios, being very diligent. And then what was your some epiphany where you said, wow, my brain is really on fire in a good way right now? Yeah. You know, I didn't I didn't have the appreciation of the brain in particular when I was in the midst of my piano, you know, love of piano and playing the piano. Uh, but I loved, I loved the creative element that I'm producing this music that if I practice really hard, I could make it sound this way, or I could make it sound that way. Uh, listening to different um, musicians that play. I, I'm obsessed with Glenn Gould and um, the Goldberg variations and, and, but then all the other ways that different people can play the Goldberg variations and make that same exact piece of music. Um, 
sing differently with with their hands. I just and had I, that on the other day, that yeah. exact recording, uh, Glenn Gould playing yeah. the Goldberg Variations, and uh, there's almost nothing better than just the aria, the very first small number of the Goldberg Variations. It's yeah. hard to beat that in the whole history of music. I agree. What He had some magic. Uh, he did it in such a unique way, and... I've always been um, not just th that fascination with Glenn Gould and the Goldberg variations uh, led me to read about him, to study him. I watched that film about him. And I'm also obsessed with the radio broadcast that he did, um, The Idea of North, where he created a Bach fugue with the voices of the people that he was interviewing and that just kind of made my brain explode it's like wow that i can't that that is so creative and and beautiful to listen to voices in that way so i i, I couldn't agree more and, and and but before i i i i ask you to analyze more things for us i just remember a few nights ago i was sitting down uh, at the piano. I'm a very poor pianist, but good enough to, you know, sort of fumble around the keyboard a little uh -huh. bit. <laughs> and, and I was I was working on the aria just very slowly because I, I had thought of this piece for a long time, but I went in July to see a friend on the coast of Maine. And, uh, and I was awoken one morning early at like 5.30 by the Goldberg Variations. He's a bassoon oh. player, uh, oh. but, but he was sort of fumbling through them too. And I'm like, oh my God, I know he's not a great pianist, but still, this is incredible. What a way to wake up. Oh, that sounds wonderful. <laughs> so so w what is it about, about the brain that takes such substance from music? Or put the other way, what does music do for the brain that's beyond what you grasped as a little kid? Well, I mean, from the neuroscience, we know that um, everybody has that piece of music that gives them chills. And, and uh, it sounds like you and I have a commonality in that, that um, Glenn Gould's Goldberg variations <laughs> can give us chills. <laughs> yes. And we know what happens to the brain. There are particular reward areas of the brain that will light up in both your brain and my brain when we listen to Glenn Gould playing the Goldberg variations. Now, somebody else that doesn't have that, they, they don't appreciate it, that brain area will not light up. Uh, but, but there are brain areas that are specialized for signaling, whoa, this is, this is amazing. Uh, when people say, you know, I just said it caused an explosion in my brain. Um, uh, when I learned about his his interview and how he created a, 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 a composition with the voices of the people that he was interviewing, um, that that wonder that um, that it's a joy that happens when we listen to Glenn Gould uh, uh, and appreciate his his amazing talent. Um, uh, and and that that there is a, a brain area devoted to that. Um, and so uh, what do we do with that? Uh, I say, <laughs> try and get it to fire as much as you can. What are those things that cause wonder in in your life? Uh, th there's no place you can look it up. You just have to go um, discover it. And and I know for me that there are certain pieces of music that um uh, that will do that. And, but so many other things, films, uh, uh, performances, other kinds of performances that I get to see here in New York, because it's just so full of performances. Um, um, even you know, conversations, conversations that we have that are so beautiful or valuable or, or meaningful to us, um, that will, there's, there's this kind of joy, um, uh, the neuroscientist that studied uh, this, uh, Robert Zatori at uh, Montreal Neurological Institute, he went after that piece of music that gave you chills. And so what gives you chills? Well, he, he knows the reward area that is activated uh, by those chills.
what is that all about? What what are the chills? Are they? I've I've written about it before. It's something everybody sort of knows vaguely what it is. But but what is it to you? I mean, uh, when I when I hear certain Puccini mm. operas, there are certain parts I I could you know make a list right now of excerpts of pieces that if you put it on, it would do it to me no matter what. I I was just <laughs> writing I was just writing a piece about Beethoven nine and and when the famous Ode to Joy theme is played for the first time by the cellos and basses and then very quietly a bassoon comes in a lone bassoon and plays a counterpoint every time i play it or hear it absolutely chills no question it's like yeah. it just takes the wind out of me what's that all about you know uh neuroscientists can do certain things uh we can we can identify a state and try and reproduce it and then study what brain activations are are associated with it the why is is much the much hard is much harder i can tell you in myself it it's a uh, it's i mean it feels like an innate reaction to um to this auditory stimulus that is that is so unique i mean we're we're um, we're drowned in sounds all the time. Most of them, I don't really want to hear them. Um, but there, there's so many beautiful sounds out there. And um, uh, there are some that, that are particularly um, powerful in, in, uh, in evoking these, these emotions. And I, I know people have studied this. There are particular beats that are... Uh, infectious what, what is that beat that makes you stand up and dance um and you can study them across cultures and many of them have the have the same kind of beat but but um i, I think what we're trying to explain and appreciate is um is is this evolution of how the brain has has evolved to be created creative to create something and then to evolve an area that that responds to that um not not necessarily only creativity but to to certain um uh certain kinds of sounds and that becomes the you know the 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 thing that that sells a million copies that sells as many copies as gold as uh glenn gould's goldberg variations so hard you know to yeah, go ahead. A, a, a lot of uh, I, I'm so glad that that you left sort of an open end there because it because it sort of illustrates in a way the mysterious power that music has, right? That that, yeah. that yes, someone as as learned as as studied as curious as seasoned as you are, you still say you know what? There's something about it that's beyond us. Oh yeah, definitely. You know, uh, Wendy Suzuki, can you talk about? brain plasticity what, what does this term mean because i you yeah. know for, for, we, we see all these articles and, and those of us who read newspapers and magazines who are browsing around online you know there's a million health articles uh, how to make your brain this that out of how to make your memory better all of these things what what's the truth <laughs> tell us well the truth is that uh brain plasticity which really refers to the brain's ability to change in response to the environment the brain is very, very responsive. Um, that that is one of its most amazing capacities. Uh, uh, the the ability to change it allows us to remember new things, uh, new new experiences. It's going to allow me to remember the sound of your voice. I've never spoken to you. I've never heard your voice before today, but I will remember uh, the sound of your voice. Do and you like that, it? I do. I do. You have a very nice voice. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> Thank you. But, you know, that, that, how am I able to do that? There are molecular changes that are happening in my brain that will allow me to uh, remember uh, the sound of your voice. And um, that is, that is uh, probably one of the most common uh, forms of brain plasticity, our ability to have our experiences that happen stick with us. They, they, they change the synapses in our brain. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, potential for that. If you have brain damage, uh, you can't grow back a new brain area, but there is potential for adaptation. 
So your brain could find new ways to do the same thing, uh, have completely different ways to do to get to the same uh, answer uh, using different parts of your brain. Uh, that's another form of plasticity. Uh, um, and uh, uh, it, it, it also uh, is very important for dealing with things like the whole world is dealing with uh, in terms of higher levels of anxiety and depression with uh, the whole situation that our world is in right now. Can we, um, can we use uh, uh, um, leverage our understanding of brain plasticity to uh, get out of the negative aspects of depression and anxiety, which can literally shrink our brain and kill brain cells and instead use it uh, for positive directions and use that kind of warning system of both anxiety and depression to, uh, um, to improve our brain and to improve our lives. Now, I don't know how old you are, but I know you're rather a young woman. What about for older people? What is the brain's reaction? Is it still possible to, to grow the brain uh, yeah. as an older person? Yeah, that's a great question. And in fact, uh, one of my favorite answers to that question is our studies that are coming out just recently um, confirming that, um, so for example, uh, Adults and children uh, with exercise, they can literally stimulate the growth of brand new brain cells in their hippocampus. Um, so it's one of the only two brain areas in the entire human brain where brand new brain cells can be born in adulthood. Um, and uh, the question is, what about if you get into older age? What if you have mild cognitive impairment or you have Alzheimer's disease? And the answer is that even older people into their ninth decade of life, they can grow new brain cells in the hippocampus. Now that capacity goes down if you do have mild cognitive impairment or Alzheimer's disease, That's that, that really slows it down. But even uh, older people have that form of brain plasticity left. So yeah, it, it's not just for the youngins. Uh, uh, many of us, uh, the, the older people, still have the capacity for a wide range of brain plasticity. Not as much as, as younger people, but it's still there. So before we get to how, how we can do that as we get older, uh, you, you said something before that was rather striking, which is anxiety and depression can literally kill brain cells. Yeah. What's, is that true? I mean, it's, it's shocking. Yeah, it is. Uh, because what happens is uh, depression and anxiety levels stimulate cortisol, the stress hormone, to be released by your adrenal medulla, which is uh, a structure just above your kidneys, that courses through your body and uh, it enters the brain. So high levels of uh, cortisol can em enter your brain. One of the structures that has the largest number of receptors for cortisol, which are basically kind of door openings. A cell can only be affected by cortisol or any other chemical if it has receptors for it. Um, one of the structures that has lots of receptors for cortisol is called the hippocampus uh, structure, very important for memory. And so we know that um, people that suffer from PTSD, they have typically very high levels of cortisol in their body for long periods of time their hippocampi are smaller uh, than normal age match people that don't have PTSD. Um, and, uh, uh, um, um, and, and we've shown this in, in animals too. Uh, famous studies done by um, Robert Sapolsky, a, a neuroscientist at Stanford, where when he was studying baboon colonies in Africa, um, he found that, that if you were the low baboon on the male totem pole, so if you're Number one, male baboon, you get to have sex with all the women and get all the food. But if you're number 10 of 10, you get no sex and you get very little food and you're stressed all the time. Well, he found that their hippocampi, they had high levels of cortisol and they had shrunken hippocampi as if they were uh, suffering from PTSD. And would that mean that, that their, their, quote, intelligence is less or the memory is weaker? Their memory uh, was likely, he didn't test the memory, but their memory was likely weaker. And uh, um, the, the, there was clearly uh, cell loss in the hippocampus. And, and we know that that cell loss, uh, at least partially, came from high levels of cortisol that activate the hippocampus. And too high levels can, can first 
kind of shrink the hippocampus and make all the, uh, uh, the processes shrivel up. And with very high extended levels of cortisol, it can kill those hippocampal cells. And that's when you start to see memory, memory impairments and size changes in the hippocampus. The other sense uh, that can be developed later in life is the, is it the, um, the, the, olfactory, the, the gustatory, the, the sense of smell. Is that yet? Yeah. So, so the olfactory bulb, you can, you can develop new brain cells there, uh, but exercise doesn't help the olfactory bulb. Um, what helps the olfactory bulb is uh, being exposed to lots of different smells. So in rodents, if you do experiments and give them uh, different smells to smell every single day, you see that their olfactory bulbs start to grow. And so you hypothesize that uh, in professions like a sommelier or perf- perfume maker um, or chef, uh, where they are using their, ta- their smell a lot uh, and smelling and tasting lots of different things, that that would be a wonderful stimulant for their olfactory bulb, which is critical for all of those different professions anyway. Uh, that's or, or for any food lover or any wine lover. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> a- a- amateur food and wine lover like like I am, like like maybe you are. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> so, uh, tell us a little bit about sort of the whole brain exercise relation. This is a thing that you have been writing and talking about for a long time, but it wasn't always who you were. You weren't always into exercise uh, and and sort of the 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 quasi religious fervor that you bring to your exercise regimens uh, as you do to your to your did, did you do a 45 minute tea this morning by the way I did I did, you did. Oh, I'm just just making sure um talk about the exercise uh how it can affect much more than uh what happens when we look in the mirror yeah so um I call exercise uh, the most transformative thing that you can do for your brain today. And that is because we know that moving your body has immediate positive effects on your brain. It has, if you do it, so even a single workout, for example, can improve your mood significantly, decrease your depression, decrease your anxiety, improve your reaction times, and improve your focus, which is dependent on the prefrontal cortex right behind your forehead. That's what you get with a, a single, you can get with a single exercise session. So, you know, no, no waiting three months to hope that I, I lose one pound on the scale. You get it immediately. Um, so, but that's just the start of it. If you continue to do exercise regularly, make it a regular part of your, uh, of your day, you start to change the um, brain's anatomy, physiology, and function. That's when you start to see brand new hippocampal cells growing in your hippocampus. Uh, You start to see not just uh, temporary changes in your mood and energy levels, but your baseline levels of mood can change. So my favorite study to quote is that um, uh, regular exercise can be just as effective as as the most commonly used antidepressant in major depressive disorder. Um, Why is that? Well, we know that even a single exercise session can increase levels of serotonin and dopamine and noradrenaline in your brain. These are the the same chemicals that uh, uh, antidepressants work to increase in your brain. So you're getting a natural boost of these uh, neurotransmitters, neurochemicals. Um, My favorite analogy is that every time you work out, it's like giving your bath a wonderful bubble bath of neurochemicals. And those neurochemicals include uh, dopamine, serotonin, and those mood boosting, anxiety busting, and depression busting um, neurotransmitters. Um, so so yeah. what, is, what is something that you consider exercise? Like picture, picture you have someone who is not the most active person in the world, yeah. uh, perhaps a little older, but... but very healthy. Uh, and what, what would be a, a reasonable form of exercise, a reasonable time and, and uh, exertion that could make a difference? Yeah, sure. So in, in fact, I like to say that uh, um, the people that aren't already on an exercise regimen, you have it easiest because uh, there's less exercise that you have to do to get your heart rate up. 
Uh, and so uh, somebody that is not used to regular exercise, a good power walk, um, certainly walking has been shown to start to have these mood boosting effects. So you certainly don't have to become a triathlete to get these effects. A good power walk is a great way to get started. And this is something I love for so many reasons. You don't have to get dressed up in your fa- in your hundred dollar you know Lululemon to 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 walk. You don't need special shoes. You just have to go outside and and start walking, and that that is is the start. Um, will it get you all the benefits? No, you you know to get the the major the um, not the major but but the full round of benefits. You need to start increasing your heart rate. You can do that with a good power walk. But you might need to start expanding out the things that you do. But with regular walking, I I think that is the very best way uh, to do it. And uh, for those of us stuck inside uh, where it's sometimes even harder to um, uh, to get outside and walk, uh, I have a personal recommendation of how aerobic housework can be Um, mopping the floor is actually really hard work. Try cleaning the bathroom, the bathtub, really good workout. So if you're looking for like uh, uh, things that you can do right now, right here, uh, that can start to get your heart rate up and be a good workout. You don't have to look uh, um, farther than your than your uh, utility closet with the mop, the broom and uh, a sponge uh, uh, to get a good workout. Well, I'm really lucky that I have an excuse not to go clean my house because I'm in rural New Hampshire, so I have the space I can just go outside. Nice. So, <laughs> so um, look, I, I want to come back to this in a minute, but but first, let's take a little diversion over to music. We started out there, but I, I want to just dig in a little bit more to what, what are you listening to? What music do you love other than the Goldberg variations? I was, well... The thing that I played the best when I was in high school <laughs> uh, was Bach. And so I have always, it, it took me a long time to expand beyond Bach and generally solo piano composers. But I, I jumped kind of almost as far as away as you can get in the classical uh, uh, canon of work. And I fell in love with choral work. I love listening to choral any any choral work um um and uh and then i fell in love with um the cello and um i have this story that i told in my book um healthy brain happy life that i i uh i had this very formative relationship um, experience when i was a junior in college and i went to um, I went to Bordeaux and I studied for a year in Bordeaux because uh, my nerdy uh, college self always had this dream that that France would be just so romantic and so amazing and it was it was totally romantic totally amazing and I ended up um, uh, going out with a musician a French musician that whole year who was a musician and he was a piano tuner and he came to tune the piano in the room that I was staying in and I met him and. Um, I, I would go to his apartment uh, and study for my classes um, every afternoon after school. And he was off tuning his pianos or working uh, in some other way. And he had a recording of Yo-Yo Ma playing Bach solo cello concertos. And I'd never heard that before. And I, I think I wore that record out. And uh, I just, I just, I mean, that's the other thing. Even more than the Goldberg variations, that still gives me chills. And uh, what what was uh, so amazing is that that Christmas, um, Francois, the my boyfriend, uh, gave me a cello for Christmas, and I didn't even play the cello. That's the cello <laughs> that's sitting behind me right now. Wow! And it so, made it to New York with you. Oh yeah, it, I I dragged it all all over the country. Um, and I even took lessons, but my my uh, my cello teacher got hired by by a wonderful symphony orchestra, and he had to leave um, New York. And so then I didn't have a cello teacher, and then I got very busy. Uh, but but I keep it here, so I, I look at it all the time uh, and remind myself that I'm going to take cello lessons. Um, I I hope you take that up at some point. It's waiting for you. It's lonely. I know. I know. Uh. I will. I will. 
you will. Um, so I, I'm, I'm going to tie this back into what we were talking about. And, and, and you gave me, I was thinking, hmm, how am I going to bring the conversation back? But you gave me an idea. Yeah. I was listening to you carefully. And, and what I wonder is your analysis of this. When I was a kid, I started till when I was four and a half years old. And, uh, and I'm very lucky that, that my parents didn't stand there with a whip and, you know, make me practice and practice more and, and sort of 10 hours a day. They, they always said, especially my mom who did a lot of the practicing with me, she always said it has to come from you. Mm. The, the, the love of the music, the love of the cello, the appreciation, the desire to want to work has to come to you because otherwise I could stand here and force you to do it, but you'll end up hating me or, or hating yeah. cello and music in the process. So what is your, 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 medical side tell you about how pleasure influences work? I imagine that that there's amazing links you, you've seen there. Well, I mean, more just personal observations. That is not a, a area specialty of, of my particular research. But absolutely, I, I personally have always been driven by my love, my fascination of, of the things that I end up doing for my profession. And so I feel incredibly lucky to have um, been able to do that. So I fell in love with the brain, um, uh, going to the um, lectures and working in the lab of my science mentor, Marion Diamond, as a freshman at, at UC Berkeley. And her love and her, her amazing teaching ability, um, she... She was, she remains the best teacher that I have ever had in my, or observed in my entire career. And I, you know, I steal all the time from her and <laughs> try and <laughs> use all her best techniques and throw in uh, all the things that I could, I could find to, to engage the students. Um, because I know, so my, my goal, I teach a, a neuroscience for non-science majors class at NYU. I'm teaching it right now. And my goal is that that I that they get so engaged, they're all worried. Um, these are non-science majors and they they feel like they're not good at science. They're worried they're gonna it's gonna be over their head. And so when I get students at the end that say, yeah, you know, I think I'm I'm interested in majoring in a science, that that is my goal um, uh, to get a couple people to actually say that to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, so, but it's, it's not because I'm forcing them. Yeah. I, they have to take the class, but to try and present why I love neuroscience so much. It, it's, it's a really the study of yourself. Why am I so unique? Why is my brain? My brain is the most complex structure known to humankind. Most people don't go around thinking that, but I do. And, and so I feel very lucky that I get to study using my brain, our collective brain, to try and better understand why it is so complex, why, why these particular cells can generate a thought or generate a shiver, as we were talking about before. I don't know the answers to those questions, but I think they are so engaging, so fascinating. Um, and so that's what I try and bring to the students. You know, I was going to ask you about teaching as we got towards the end. You, you brought it up. How do you design the courses that you teach? How do you determine how closely related your teaching is to what you're working on outside of the classroom? I think I, uh, I approached it in a kind of a systematic way. I used to be just a very clear teacher. My, my goal was to be very clear in my delivery of just the standard, uh, um, you know, things that that the class needed to cover, and I, I was good at that. And but then I got a little bit more um, creative, and uh, uh, two classes illustrate that. And one of them, one of the classes came when I was getting really interested in exercise, and um, uh, I was studying memory at the time. But I started to notice how much exercise was changing my brain. And I started to read about the neuroscience of exercise. And so I realized that the best way for me to learn this new topic that I wanted to learn 
very, very selfishly, was to teach a new undergraduate class on it. Because if I learn it well enough to teach it to the undergrads, then I really learn it. So I set out to study this, this area that, you know, it involved the hippocampus. So I, I, had, uh, uh, I had expertise in that. But then I thought, well, I, uh, the only reason I'm doing this is because I started exercising regularly. I lost 25 pounds. I felt great. Then I started being curious about the neuroscience. And um, wouldn't it be fun if I could bring exercise into the classroom? And uh, when my department wouldn't pay for an exercise instructor that I very politely asked for, um, I decided that I would go train as an exercise instructor. And then I asked them <laughs> to pay for my, for my teacher training, which they did. So they paid for my teacher training because I said it's all for the students. And I went to go get trained as an exercise instructor. I practiced for six months for all my friends. Like I would beg individual friends to come over to my apartment so I can teach them an exercise class. I did it so much for my cat that my cat can do exercise with me. He's, he's really good at it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then I brought exercise into the classroom, which which transformed the classroom. Turns out if you swap with your professor, you're, you're much more open to asking questions and to uh, kind of, uh, uh, I feel like it opened a door to creativity and openness in the classroom that never would have opened if I hadn't made everybody exercise with me. And then I, um, and then I applied that to a different class where I was like, I didn't want to make everybody exercise. That's not my only thing. I thought, and this actually relates to you. Oh, you're, you'll really like this example. I decided to um, uh, develop a class called Art Meets Brain because I thought, what is the most fascinating thing that people always wonder about? And the answer was creativity, human creativity. And so I asked all my coolest friends that did creative things to share their creativity. And then I use that as a jumping off point to talk about the neuroscience of it. And my, my former cello teacher who went off to join the Cleveland Sym Symphony Orchestra came in to illustrate motor learning. He learned, and I'm not gonna remember the piece, I'm sure you know it, but I can't remember. He, he learned a piece for us and he went through his process as a professional cellist of how how he learns a piece. And then of course he performed it for us, which was just mind blowing right there in the classroom to get a, a, an amazing um, performance. And, and, I, and then I talked about motor learning and what do we know? What are the brain areas involved? What changes in our motor cortex when we learn things? So my idea was that it was gonna be a wonderful motivation to, to kind of appreciate right there in front of their eyes some of the amazing creativity of, of, of the human, uh, and then, and then jump in and say, okay, here's what we know about the neuroscience. Let's, let's jump into that. That is fantastic. Those are lucky students. They had a great cello demonstration uh, and a great, exciting professor. You know, I, I was thinking about what you were saying about exercise and, and we were talking about younger and older people. What about really young people? What, what about kids? How important is it that, a I don't know, a, a six-year-old or I, I, however early people start to exercise. I, I don't have kids. I'm not sure. How, how early is it to, to have a kid be really active from, from the time he's, he's able to be? Yeah. You know, I think that evolutionarily it's clear that humans were evolved to move. It's only in this culture where we get glued to our Zoom screens for way too many hours a day that it becomes a chore. We have to invent ways to start start moving. So so a healthy body means a healthy brain. So as long, I mean that's why kids are running around all the time. That is their natural that's their natural state. And while they still need to go to school, um, I I do not uh, agree with the idea of just forcing them to sit there and do the standardized tests. They need to include physical activity for normal healthy um um brain function and to help the learning process itself. So absolutely important at all levels. Um, the more you move, the more, um, the more uh, um, healthy your brain is. And my favorite example 
uh, for how important that is, is not in young children, but in um, uh, middle-aged people, I'll say middle-aged, uh, women in their 40s, back in the 1960s uh, in Sweden, 200 of them, they were assessed, they were determined to be low fit, mid fit or high fit. 44 years later, the researchers came back to determine what happened to these 200 people. And what they found was relative to the low fit, the women that were characterized as low fit in their 40s, the women that were characterized as high fit, um, again, when everybody's in their 80s, they staved off dementia by nine years more on average. Wow. Nine years. Wow. Yeah. And and that comes from, you think, uh, casual walking or more involved uh, sort of get the heart rate up sweating? Do you have to break a sweat? Uh, so uh, high fit uh, typically uh, um, suggests that these people were sweating. They had a regular workout routine, but those details weren't all included in the study. They were just characterized as, as high fit. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, uh, that's so, so uh, yeah, I mean, so that, that is my, um, I, I should also say that that is not a randomized control study. It's not causation. So everybody who, uh, is high fit by definition, you will all get nine years more. Uh, it's a correlation, but it goes in the right direction. It is consistent with everything we know about what exercise is doing. It's it's um, strengthening the brain areas that we know are most susceptible to aging and dementia, the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. It's making them bigger and stronger. So it doesn't uh, cure aging. It doesn't cure Alzheimer's disease, but it takes longer for those natural processes to damage the areas enough so that you start seeing a dementia coming in. You start seeing that that rapid forgetfulness uh, that happens in older age. So, can, I ask, can I ask you a silly question? Yeah. What, do you think the Congress of the United States would work better if everybody were a cellist who went on runs regularly? <laughs> um, <laughs> I must say yes. I, I, I have... <laughs> I, I, I'm not optimistic about about our Congress. Um, I think there's so many divisions and, and there are lots of systemic problems. But yes, I think exercise and creative outlets like cello playing or any instrument playing um, or core. I think that they should all be in the chorus together, um, not so they give each other any viruses, but but to <laughs> work together in a group in a creative sense. Although I'm sure some would, would like it for, for the other idea. If, 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 yes, if, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what are you working on now that really excites you? Uh, obviously, are, are you are you doing everything from home? Are you going into the laboratory at all and, and playing with, with dials and big screens? <laughs> or? I am doing everything from home. Uh, I'm running all the research experiments virtually, which is uh, a blessing. We're able to do that uh, with a great lab group that I have. Uh, the thing I'm most excited about is a company that I uh, started called BrainBody. Um, I'm founder and CEO of that of that company. And that company um, helps translate the neuroscience research of how transformative and how amazing exercise is for your brain to give you, Daniel, uh, information. So uh, what Brain Body does is it allows you to quantify the effects of your different workouts on your brain. So you take short assessments before and after whatever kind of workout you want to do, including a, a walk around rural New Hampshire. Um, uh, and, and we can tell you exactly how much your mood and focus is changing. And we are developing the platform to be able to create kind of long-term exercise regimens that will maximize your brain function, um, hopefully for the rest of your life. Well, I love it. I do more lifting of weights than walking, but I, I, but I do also do uh, bike rides and runs, uh, yeah. although I've had a sprained ankle recently, oh. but it's almost better. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm going to look this up. And, and so what well, can we get it on our smartphone? Um, no, we're, we're, we're still a startup company. Uh, we are working with other businesses. So, so, uh, um, uh, it's not available widely yet, 
But hopefully in the next year, we will be launching uh, uh, for the general public. Uh, We're working hard on that. But that is the thing I'm most excited about, uh, working on that, as well as, you know, uh, uh, doing my lab work I'm teaching. It's a lot of of things going on. (laughs) Brain body, we're going to, I have a bookmarked already here on my computer. Uh, We're going to keep an eye on it. And, And Wendy Suzuki, I hope you'll come back. I love talking to you. I love talking to you, too. I would love to come back. You've been listening to Talking Beats with Daniel Lalchuk. I hope you'll subscribe and leave a review on Apple, Spotify, or anywhere you get your podcasts. The original theme music for this program is by Ronald Markham. The content coordinator is Nathaniel Mosse. Doug Christian is the executive producer. I'm Daniel Lalchuk. See you next time.